Good afternoon, everybody. Professions for Good found during some work it was doing last year that there was a perception that the financial crisis had led to the breakdown of trust between members of public and professional firms and business communities. And we've already heard this afternoon lots of other examples of how that's been happening over a longer period of time. And as a result of that, Professions for Good hosted a series of roundtables earlier this year to explore the whole area of trust and professionals from a range of perspectives. I'm here to share with you the key findings from all the discussions, all the roundtables. And they were discussions that involved not just representatives of professionals, that would have been too easy, but also leaders of key institutions and public figures, people who could put forward the view of the public. And so in no way did the roundtables just include the usual suspects, very wide ranging. AAT, the Association for Accounting Technicians, the professional body for accounting technicians, hosted the first round table. I happen to be the past president of the AAT, and I was delighted when Louis asked me if I would chair that particular event. The particular focus of that discussion was around individuals and around who do we trust as individuals. And you could ask yourself questions like, is it about there being a certificate hanging on the wall? Is it about there being letters after the name? Is it about honesty and integrity? What is it that makes you trust a professional? And last week, I went to the dentist. Now, I know my dentist extremely well. I've known him for very many years. And I was conscious of this point about certificates hanging on walls when I went in there, and I was very impressed. He had a whole load of certificates up there, of courses he'd been on. And then I was slightly disconcerted because all of them were dated at least 20 years ago. And so I was faced with the problem of how, or indeed do I, tell my dentist that he's not doing himself any favours with the way he's presenting his qualifications. As he has been my dentist for a long time, and I trust him dearly, I decided not to mention it. But it does raise the issue about how do we demonstrate our credentials. Now, in the roundtable discussions, we looked at which professions we all had contact with. This was the first table that I was chairing. And rather than talking about the ones where we were the professionals, which were the ones where we were the service users? Before you knew it, we were all busy sharing medical stories. Now, as the person that was chairing that particular group, that was quite a challenge, um, because, surprise, surprise, everybody had got a story. But what was really interesting was how we agreed the themes that came through those stories. Very much we agreed, first of all, that technical knowledge from a professional was pretty much taken for granted. We weren't troubled about that but their behaviour was seen as potentially the weakest link. For us to trust someone, it was vital that they listened to us. And it wasn't just that they were listening and waiting for us to pause so that they could start talking again. It was very much so that they were really listening. We wanted to have things explained to us so that we as customers, as consumers, were given options and so that we could make informed choices. So that gives you a bit of a flavour about two of the topics that we'd looked at that morning. I haven't got time in, in the minutes allotted to me to go through stories to do with all the areas, but what I want to do now is share with you the findings that came out of the rest of those round tables that we had. First of all, those first two points I made, you can summarise as saying that the first one was about Professionals need to be transparent about their motivation. Very much to do with making it very clear that they're giving the best advice, regardless of what people want to hear. So about being annoying when necessary. And the second point that came through was that it was about people being transparent and inclusive about their thought process. That in, in 
professionals, whilst they might know what they're doing, need to be able to share what they're doing, share enough of that knowledge, that expertise with the client so that the client feels that they are on a journey with the professional. A couple of other areas around the whole question of why do you trust somebody. Um, the other point we came up with was that people need to be, you, you trust more the people that you are close to. So if you know a professional, you're more likely to trust them than you are to trust the amorphous organisation that they represent. And then there was also an issue around if people have got a positive track record. If we know that they've got not just an experience as a successful professional, but also of giving something back to society, we felt that that might also lead on to our trusting them just a little bit more. So, that was the first area that we explored at the first of the round tables. There were five other areas that we looked at during the remaining two round tables and also touched on at the first one. The first area is around what are the challenges to professional trust. We came up with three. No rocket science here. Surprise, surprise, modern technology is a challenge to professional trust. We felt this was for two reasons, really. One was that there's so much information out there that people can feel that they're an expert and don't appreciate the absolute knowledge, skills, experience that go into the expertise of a professional. And the other one was if, that if somebody's had a bad experience with a professional, they can actually very easily go out and tell the world now. And so therefore we felt that was one of the challenges to professional trust. The second area is one that we've already talked about this afternoon, about trying to get more out of less. If we've got times, or we are in times, where there's financial crisis, reduced resources for professionals, and yet professionals are being expected to do more and more with less and less, particularly in sectors such as the public sector, then how do you manage the expectations of the customer? Because it's, a, it's an equation that's not going to work out. And so we found that the increasing divide between expectation and delivery was another challenge to professional trust. And then, of course, we recognise that there are not that many, but significant, when they do happen, high-profile lapses in trust that need to be um, addressed when they happen in some way, because they're definitely going to damage the reputation between professionals and clients and, indeed, the wider business community. The third area we looked at over the roundtables was about what are the consequences of a loss in trust. We reckon there were two. Reputation damage to the actual organisation or individuals, but then much more globally, if there was damage to UK professions as a whole, then that actually damaged UK PLC. And we very much saw that as a, a threat we then asked ourselves, how do we strengthen trust or rebuild it when it's been lost? First of all, and again, this came out partly from our medical experiences that we were sharing in the first round table. Um, if mistakes have been made, we very much welcomed that if people owned up to them and explained what had happened. We felt that was the first step in trying to rebuild trust. Taking visible, proactive steps to remedy the situation can actually lead to the public eventually having greater trust in an organisation than before. Um, Richard will be the expert here in, in marketing stories and so on, but um, the world is full of, of case studies around scenarios such as Perrier Water and what they did when wrong things were discovered in their bubbles and how actually as a result of how they dealt with that crisis they ended up in a far better position. So dealing with a problem can really move you forward. The next point that came out about rebuilding or strengthening trust was all about change needs to come from the top. And what's very much come through the whole of this afternoon is this whole business about the overall culture of an organisation. Um, we were talking about CEOs and MDs in the forums. Louis already talked about corporate governance, which gives us an even wider look on that whole issue. What's really interesting, though, is when you put this against Richard's presentation where he was commenting on the role model gap 
and that the people at the top feel that they understand things, but actually in practice, uh, they don't necessarily. And so if we are trying to make change happen from the top, then it's a really big issue. Um, and it's to do with trying to help the whole organisation embody the values and the cultural change that's needed. So a really, really big challenge there. Um, I have to say, because we've been talking this afternoon about organisations and organisations with all sorts of um, laudable characteristics that have been up on the slides that Richard had up earlier on, um, the delight of being involved as a non-executive director of AAT is that AAT is a beautifully sized organisation with 200 staff. And it's actually a staff that, an organisation that absolutely lives its values. It really is a learning organisation. It's an organisation where people own up to mistakes and we move on from that. And um, in a way, unless you've experienced an organisation like that, you can't appreciate how innovating, how freeing, how positive it is and how you can move forward with things. So I hope I'm allowed to have just a little bit of a um, commercial for AAT at that point in time. One of the other issues that we have around um, trying to make change happen and, and recovering from problems is about the whole question of the fact that the bottom line seems to matter an awful lot in this country. And so if we want to actually change the professionalism and how people do things, we need to think some more about how much should the bottom line matter. And should companies think more about the public interest rather than self-interest? That's an eno another enormous topic that I'm sure we can talk about some more later on this afternoon. And then looking to the future, the other thing about redressing balance is really about making sure that we have the young people that we need in order to help inculcate in them the whole understanding about professionalism. I'm not going to go back into the Jesuit analogy, but if you just follow through the point that if people don't understand the idea of professionalism at a point in their lives when they're beginning to decide whether or not they ought to become a professional, then we've lost the plot at trying to sell the benefits, the absolute benefit to society, to individuals, to everybody of having strong professions. The fifth area we touched just briefly was about whether there should be a code of ethics or regulation right across the profession. And actually, we recognise that all individual bodies have their own code of ethics, so we don't really need to worry too much about um, coming up with some other extra um, layer of ethics. And we were also pleased that major lapses in trust are generally few and far between, and that if you start regulating, you might risk what happened with Sarbanes-Oxley, where you end up with regulation that's done very quickly um, with unintended consequences. So I think we felt that at the moment, the way we were dealing with ethics and regulation across the profession wasn't broke enough to suddenly come in with a whole new set of rules. And I think the whole area of rules versus principles is another interesting area that we might want to touch on a bit later on. The final area we covered in the roundtables was around the whole question about whether you can turn trust into a competitive advantage. Um, so can we actually benefit from the fact, can organisations that can demonstrate trustworthy ethical behaviour um, succeed um, when they're putting in for procuring work, for example? Is it part of the things that they're ticked against in order to say they're doing it well? Um, or turning it around the other way, if being professional is a core capability of professional firms, which it is, then if you look at any guide, any advice on strategy, what you should be doing as an organisation is making use of your core capabilities. And so maybe there's more that organisations need to be doing that are professionals to make sure they're making use of those capabilities. And then the final point that very much leads through into our discussion uh, that we discovered is that we don't see commercial and commercialism over here and ethical or trustworthy behaviour over here. We don't see them as being a dichotomy at all. We see commercialism as being a natural part of ethical and trustworthy behaviour and the other way around. So you can be commercial and you can be ethical and trustworthy was the conclusion that we were reaching from the end of the roundtables. So that takes you through a whistle-stop tour 
um, of what we found from them. It only remains for me to thank Louis and Professions for Good for actually facilitating the roundtables, which gave us the opportunity to, came up with, to come up with these findings.